CPOV. CertainPOV.com. Before we get started, I just want to give a special thank you and shout out to our podcast network, Certain POV. You can find us and all their other awesome shows at certainpov.com. That's C E R T A I N P O V.com. So I have a question. Have you ever wanted to get into comics, but you just didn't know where to start? Well, welcome to Comics Quest. I'm J.D. Martin, and every week I sit down with a guest to talk a comic that I think anybody can pick up and start their comics reading journey. We take a look at psychedelic sci-fi, fantastic action, heart-wrenching love stories, and of course, superheroes. So check us out at CertainPOV.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hello, and welcome to How the Fuck, the talk show turned podcast where we chat with folks who know what the fuck they're doing and ask them how the fuck they got there. I'm your host, Katie DiMatteis. I'm also your host, Ben Martin Mooney. And I'm your third liest host, Zeki Alakaya. Today, we are joined by Danny Fingeroff, a writer and editor best known for his work in the comic book industry. He's written numerous comics for Marvel Comics, including runs on Spider-Man and Iron Man. He's also served as an editor at Marvel and has written books about the history and impact of comics. So, Danny. Yes. How the fuck? You know, when you say how the fuck, it doesn't have the same impact as Katie and her very refined... uh, (laughs) I think... (laughs) Uh, think- fucking A is uh, what uh, you know, this would be proper response or a response. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I have been writing books. I guess the main thing I'm promoting now, and, and I'm going to be obnoxiously and, you know, uh, repetitive about this, is I have a biography of a guy named Jack Ruby who changed history when he uh, killed Lee Harvey Oswald. We presumed oh, yeah. assassin of John F. Kennedy uh, on live television in 1963. So the book is called uh, Jack Ruby, The Many Faces of Oswald's Assassin, and it's uh, published by Chicago Review Press. So that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's all I do. However, I have been involved with a few comic books over the years. Um, and I was a writer and editor at Marvel Comics uh, for a long time, best known for my work on Spider-Man, much of it with some guy named uh, J.M. Uh, Dematis, Demateus, um, whatever his name is. I was very involved uh, working uh, with that guy. Um, I wrote um, a comic called Dark Hawk, which was kind of a riff on a Spider-Man type teenage character. For some reason, I've written more issues of the Dazzler than any human, living or dead, uh, who was a disco superhero who debuted after disco had died. So because in comics, we're always right on the middle aged uh, people making uh, your comics are always on top of the, of the latest trends and, uh, and fads and and passions of of the youth of uh, America. Um, I work, yeah, I worked on Iron Man. Um, I um, have done a million weird things as a freelancer and consultant um and uh, we can get into more of those so um that's who i am excellent and so in just quickly going over that brief uh summary it can't begin to you know go into those million projects um but you have had a long and storied career in comic books um can you share how you first got involved with comics and like what drew you to the field to begin with? Certainly it wasn't disco, was it? <laughs> it was not disco. Um, well, I mean, as a kid, I, I was the perfect age um, for the so-called Marvel revolution of the 1960s. When, when those comics came out, I was eight, nine, ten years old. Um, and I didn't have Fantastic Four one, but I did have, I think the first one I bought off the stand was Fantastic Four number four, which was the return of the Submariner. It was a golden age, uh, timely character. Timely was the name of Marvel, but I, and I'd already been reading comics since I was like five years old. 
Uh, so I was jaded. By the time I was eight or nine, I'd seen everything and read everything, or so I thought. Uh, and, so the, and then these Marvel comics came out, and with the combined creative energies of Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Larry Lieber, Don Heck, um, Dick Ayers, they, it was really an approach to superhero comics that I think, in retrospect, borrowed a lot from like uh, TV drama and TV comedy, and it was it, they they figured out a way to make it a hybrid medium. I was the perfect age, so that brought me in as a lover of uh, of those particular comics, and I was one of those people to whom the medium itself, that com- the way of combining words and images, resonated with me from the very earliest. Uh, years, you know, starting with newspaper comics in the various New York area newspapers, and then cartoon adaptations. Especially, I was a big fan of Popeye the Sailor and, and all that whole universe uh, of ca- cartoons and 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 comic books. Um, and so I I read comics and the Marvels. I was a big superhero fan. Um, then when the Undergrounds came in when I was a teenager, I had a certain amount of interest in those. Uh, Robert Crumb. Um, uh, Gilbert Shelton, S. Clay Wilson, later on Art Spiegelman, Harvey Pekar. That that was, but that was later, uh, when I was more in college and and uh, and in the work world. But but I was always interested and fascinated by the medium, um, uh, to the point uh, where I studied film in college, which was really sort of, you know, comics that move. You know, they had a lot in, you know, I mean. I think there's a lot of things that comics do that movies can't and the other way around. So when people say comics are movies on paper, I don't think that's quite true, but, but they're combinations of words and pictures uh, in, in sort of a structured experience presented to you by uh, passionate, uh, talented storytellers, if you're lucky. Um, and then I had sort of abandoned uh you know the the superhero stuff as far as regularly reading them, but I came out of college with a with a degree uh, in filmmaking uh, taught by people who are what we what we call the American avant garde, uh, with a guy named Ken Jacobs being maybe the most uh, famous of that crew. But uh, if people have heard of work by Stan Brackage, uh, Robert Greer, Maya Darren, it was that sort of school. So it was a great education and fairly impractical. So I, like every kid after college, I came back to my hometown, and my hometown happened to be uh, Manhattan Island. Uh, so I thought, what am I going to do? Oh, you know, I might be fun to work at Marvel Comics. It was interesting. I didn't say it might be fun to work at DC Comics. I somehow had it in my mind, Marvel Comics, maybe because I had like a distant contact there. Somebody could get me in the door for an informational interview, which is what I did, and that led to um, my getting a job as an assistant to Stan Lee's brother, Larry Lieber, who had just come back from a offshoot, uh, not an offshoot, come back from a competing company. This goes into the deep into the weeds of comic book history. Larry had been the editor-in-chief at a company called Atlas Seaboard, which was formed by the founder of Marvel, Martin Goodman because he was unhappy with um, the way things had developed after he sold the company. Anyway, Larry was back. Uh, I came on as his assistant, and we put out, it was called the British Department, and we put out comic books for sale uh, in England to compete with the uh, what was then the black and white weekly British market. So that was my, my professional entry into comics. And really then I, because we were doing a lot of reprint materials, um, it led to me, reading and catching up on the years of comics that I'd missed when I hadn't been following them. So, it, and then, and then within a couple, within a year or two, I was in the, the mainstream editorial, the British department, then actually moved to England. Um, for some reason, um, a guy named Des Skin came over. He was a British publisher with one of the otter names, but a very talented guy. And, um, Skin with two ends, by the way, which is why I said I pronounced it Skin. <laughs> That's a real comic book name, right? Dez Skin. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, maybe his name was really Joe Smith. But uh, anyway, Dez came over and convinced the powers that be that maybe to compete in the British market, the comics should not all be done by guys from the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, you know, 
and and, uh, and maybe actual British people should do them. So that's exactly what they did. And I sort of migrated uh, into the mainstream uh, editorial department at Marvel. Wow. Cool. Wow. <laughs> that is, <laughs> that's quite an adventure. <laughs> and that was just like the first uh, year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I find it amazing um because I've, I've seen it in my own career path and stuff that whatever, like the things when you are a small child and things that kind of help shape your core memories, they seem to like always uh, come and like come back to the surface when you're like finding uh, like what you need to be doing as an adult, it seems. And I, I think it's, um, it's so crazy to me when I, I hear it from other people as well, that that's kind of what happened. Well, I mean, I guess, A, I think there's something to be said for that. But of course, in a way, because you're interviewing people who are in those fields, and when they trace their histories back, it seems very logical. Um, but maybe if you, you know, I mean, I certainly know people who were comics fans, fellow comic fans when I was a kid, who went on to be doctors, lawyers, whatever. They maintain their love of the medium, um, and I guess maybe they maybe they were so impressed with Don with Doctor Don Blake and Thor and with Matt Murdock's uh, legal abilities. I mean, I'm 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 only half kidding. I mean, maybe that that might have had some influence uh, on their on their career choices, um, you know. But uh, uh, so it's it's you know it's a kind of a chicken and egg thing. I don't know which. You know, but certainly, yeah. If you if if you if you're talking to somebody about a field, and of course, popular culture is so pervasive, it's hard. You know, it's hard for to imagine anybody doing anything where they didn't first see some role model for it uh, somewhere. I mean, I I, I um, you know, I think what I, I, in comics, and I think in 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 any creative field. You know, some people are like narrowly focused. Like, I got to do this one thing. I have to write. I have to write screenplays. I have to direct. But there are other people who I think are more, you know, more generally focused. You know, they take aim at a general kind of work and kind of career. And so maybe they, you know, maybe they don't have this very specific. I can only do that. Have that one job, or I won't be happy. But sort of, you look at a at a broad spectrum of, of things that you know that that you uh, that you hope you know as much as you can as much as you can know in your teens or early twenties what the hell it is that will make you happy and fulfilled. I mean, the day that I had the job offer at Marvel, I also had a job offer uh, to learn to be a sauté chef at a, <sighs> at a at a at an Upper East Side restaurant. Really. No, I had an interest. I had some interest in cooking and the restaurant business and sort of that whole kind of idea of being a host and, you know, the creative aspect of cooking. Uh, actually, a guy I went to high school with uh, founded a very, uh, what had been for a long time, a famous restaurant called Chanterelle in New York. It's a long closed, but he's still in the restaurant. He you know, became a very well-known chef, uh, a guy named David Waltuck. And, um, you know, that's sort of a big what if. I mean, ultimately, I really... And again, this is one of those half joking, half serious things. I figured there would be less boiling oil involved in working in the comic book business, so I, so I opted for that. I opted for that job, but on a different day, maybe I would have made a different choice. I mean, that that makes sense, and it's always interesting, sort of the divergent paths that we could have taken in our lives. Um, but it is awesome that you took the job at Marvel because now we're here. Exactly. Um, so it was all leading to this moment. All, this this is why you were put on this planet this for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious. You have been a writer. You have been an editor. You have worked in comics. You have worked in regular books. Um, what has been your favorite project that you've worked on, and why? You know, I think you ask any person involved in any creative field, and they'll say it's the thing that I've just finished. You know. You know, not really, not purely for commercial, you know, because it becomes it's all part it's all part of a story and a narrative. I mean, it, again, maybe maybe that's why I do what I do, and your dad does what he does because we look yeah at things in terms of story and 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 one thing leading to another. But 
you know, say I wrote this, but you know, this is my second biography. Um, I did the Stan Lee biography a few years ago. Now this one about Jack Ruby, not Jack Kirby, Jack Ruby. Although Jack Kirby drew a Jack a story about Jack Ruby years ago, um, to make things even more confusing. Um, but this is also the first book I've written that's not about comics. It you know it's really you know I had sort of I've written a number of books and. I had established some credibility as a biographer, depending on who you ask. Some people think I haven't, but many people think that I have established credibility as a biographer. And this Ruby thing started as a graphic novel project about 12 years ago. And so these, in, you know, it didn't happen, although a great artist named Rick Geary was, is attached to it, and we may yet do it. But um, a few years ago, um, my agent and I decided to try to make it work as a biography now that I'd written the Stan Lee book and it was a real challenge, you know, so, so creative people or people who think we're creative, um, think everything is the next challenge. Once you get good at something, it's almost, okay, I've gotten good at that or as good as I'm going to get at that or, or, you know, let's try this other thing. Let's try this thing that I'm not comfortable with. Let's go outside my comfort zone, you know, and then of course the topic I picked, I naively picked the topic because I was not somebody who spent decades obsessed with the Kennedy assassination. So even though I knew, of course, that there were all these theories, uh, I didn't realize quite how many there were and how passionate people were about them. And then, of course, my project before that, you know, was about Stan Lee. And, and for those who know the inside baseball of comics, there's all this controversy about who created which aspects of the of the Marvel characters and who got rewarded both in terms of fame and money fairly. And and again, I went into that, even though I'd been in the business for decades, somehow I just thought that there was a somewhat straightforward story to tell about Stan Lee. So my joke is, you know, I didn't get enough, you know, um, shit from people about trying to write an objective book about Stan Lee. I thought I'd try something easy after that, like the Kennedy assassination. I don't know if that answered your question, but <laughs> no, I think I think it did, and I think that I understand what you're saying about the most recent thing being the thing that is going to feel like your favorite because I think that like as you evolve as a creative person, your your style and your understanding and your interests shift. So I I would hope that the thing that you did most recently is the thing that has fulfilled you the most and brought you the most joy. Um, and that's that's really great to hear. Yeah, I mean the thing about comics, of course. I mean there was, there was this very, it was this funny feeling about being part of this Marvel universe, you know, which is that obviously I always tried to do my best, and I tried to get the best out of the people who I worked with, you know, when I was an editor and, and manager. But it is weird that 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 every story I've done and that everybody's done somewhere fits in the Marvel universe, somewhere fits in that ongoing mm -hmm. narrative that started really in 1939 with the first Submariner and Human Torch stories. And, you know, there's, there's retconning and, and, you know, revising and, and things get written in and out of continuity, but it is it, you know, somewhere, you know, so somewhere, you know, even something, whether it's something that I worked you know, my tail off on and, 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 and put every iota of energy in or something that I hacked out for a deadline, all that stuff all goes into like the mix. And, and it's, um, it's just funny to be part of this ongoing, uh, never ending story. And that's such an awesome thing to get to be a part of and to always be a part of. Yeah. Whether they like it or not. <laughs> whether they want you there or not, they're right. stuck with you. <laughs> Taking sort of a step back from the individual projects, having worked both as a writer and as an editor, you have somewhat of a, a more unique perspective on the industry as a whole. And I'd love if you could explain uh, in in detail to to folks listening. You know, we've we've had a certain writer on the show before, one who you happened to mention earlier, who may or may not be related to one of our other hosts. Technically, <laughs> technically, he's never been on the show. That's true. We well, only okay. interviewed him that's, for our Twitch channel. That's a fair point. <laughs> fair point. Um, but for those who maybe are less familiar, could you go into uh, some detail around what the actual role of an editor is in 
not just in, in, in the comic book world, but maybe in, in sort of like in literature, in, you know, literary circles a, as a whole? Well, I mean, that, that's, you know, that's at least two questions. It's probably a hundred questions, but fair, you know, but look on a, on a certain level, the editor's job is to make sure that when something is published, the pages are not blank. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> That whatever, whether you're in the book publishing business or the magazine periodical publishing business, something has to happen from the mission statement of the of the periodical and the company, or the or the or the uh, or the promotional uh, blurb for the book, and whatever it takes to take that from the germ of an idea to a to a, to a, something in whatever medium that somebody reads or listens to. So in ter- in terms of an editor. So sometimes that, you know, and so there's the nuts and bolts of, you know, getting the pages in, getting them in order, you know, making them, sending them, you know, trafficking them from one freelance um, you know, creator to another into the production department. Into, you know, so there's that nuts and bolts stuff. That's one part of it. But, but the part that's generally more interesting is working with creative people uh, who occasionally can be temperamental, you might have heard. And uh, and working as a team, you play whatever. And, I, and now I'm really talking to a large degree about so-called corporate comics, a Marvel or a DC thing that are mm-hmm. done on an almost assembly line basis, where a lot of the duties of writing and drawing are split up. But um, I think it's true also, even if you're if you're serving as an editor for someone who's a one-person band, you know, where somebody writes, draws. There's always some cooperation uh, that needs to be done uh, along the way. But you play whatever role you need to to get. You know, there's that old saying, do you want it good or do you want it Tuesday? And as an editor, mm-hmm. you know, usually what your answer is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and sometimes one or the other of those of those parameters has to give or take a back seat. But, you know, there you play... Uh, father, mother, sibling, teacher, disciplinarian, psychiatrist, <laughs> you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, what, whatever you have to do to get that paper to not be blank and to have something come out that's as good as everybody involved can can make it. So that those are, and and of course, a lot of that is about chemistry. You know, there are some people who think I'm the best editor they ever worked with. There are some people who think I'm the worst editor they ever worked with. I'm the same guy, so there's got to be something about chemistry, and I think a lot of it goes back as maybe maybe you would not find the surprising from a guy who wrote a book called Superman on the Couch. A lot of it goes back to how you got along with your own family and what the dynamics were, and whether whether soft spoken persuasion or frightening yelling was the coin of the realm in your house when you grew up. So it 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 really it. It's a very interesting job, and, and very often, especially again, working for a Marvel or DC or, or, or any big uh, company like that, there are on any given day 500 different decisions you have to make, and so a lot of it comes down to delegating and just making a decision. You know, I mean, it's while a lot of things uh, can be affected, including people's incomes, including your own income and your own job security, and you try to make the the best decision you can. It is literally not brain surgery, you know. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of um, stress. Uh, but it, but you, you know, in general, nobody is actually going to die if you make a mistake in the comic book. We hope at least. We hope. <laughs> comic books are are often seen as like a niche form of storytelling. What do you think makes comics special? And and how they evolved over the years. You know, it's funny you say that niche thing. I, and I say it with like in the same breath that all these uh, movies and TV shows have been kind of blossoming in recent years. Um, but speaking particularly just about like the paper medium well, itself, yeah. Well, you know, that's what I want to. That's actually what I wanted to talk about. Like everybody, I often succumb to the seductive siren song of Amazon. Amazon, you know, is is, is the zipless, I guess, since the name of this show, it's the zipless fuck of consumerism. (laughs) They could not make it any more easy for you to buy shit. (laughs) That's like, and, you know, and and so, you know, 
when I know what I want and I know all the downsides of Amazon and all that, but holy cow, when you want something, it's there. But I walked into a Barnes and Noble yesterday, in part to convince them to, you know, promote and sell my new book, which they will be doing if you're if you're in the vicinity of the Barnes and Noble on Broadway and 82nd Street in Manhattan. And I went up to the manga section. Holy cow! I knew manga was popular, but I had no idea. I don't think there was any other department in this big Barnes and Noble that had as many selections as the manga section. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you say it's a niche, it's a big niche. And then, you know, I think, and and you're right. Most people, I have to say, I've been in and around comics my entire adult life, and my and as a kid. And there are still relatives of mine who I think you know are very fond of me, and even you know uh, what I do, who still think it's cute. That I'm in comics, you know, hmm. it, it, you know, it's a, uh, which, and again, again, I mean, I, it's a mixed thing because I hear, you know, you know, I mean, I don't, it's just, it's just funny. They don't quite get that that's actually not only what I do, but what anybody does, <laughs> you know, but, you know, so look, yeah, you're right. Not a, m- most, most people know Spider-Man. Most people know uh, the Avengers from the movies, TV shows, uh, animated series. But I, 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 and so comics are a niche, and the superhero comic is a, is becoming more and more of a niche. It's it's more and more aimed at. I think I think you know the actual printed comics are aimed more at you know middle aged and above people, many of them men, you know, for that genre and that and, and that uh, for that genre. You know, most people who the genre is incredibly popular in movies, TV, video games. But then you go to like the, the Dove Pilkies of the world and, and the Raina Telgemeiers, who literally sell millions of, of comics and graphic novels on a regular basis, you know, at the Scholastic Book Fairs and at bookstores and, and online. So, so yes, even then, not as many people buy comics and read comics as 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 watch tv or or, uh, or 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 play video games or go to the movies but i don't think it's you know i i don't think niche is the right word i could see why you'd say that there must be some other word you know that there must be some other word for a period for a publication that sells more than a million copies <laughs> you know yeah no definitely although i get there 350 million people in the country so it's still you know like one half of one percent but you know <laughs> I think I totally avoided your question. So what was it? No, 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 it's totally okay. Uh, that's like, that's an important aspect of it because as, as you're defending the fact that they are, are not a niche thing, you're, you're inherently talking about why you think they're special and, and why you think they have like the reach and everything that they do have, uh, especially with uh, manga and everything kind of evolving uh, which is the second part of the question. So what, like, continuing in that vein, like, what makes them special for you? And and what other things maybe have you noticed in the evolution of comics over the years? Oh, that's an easy, 25 words or less. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, look, there. I know a lot of very intelligent people who literally cannot read comics. They're neurologically not wired. People who like have advanced degrees will look at a comic page and go, I don't get it. Left to right, right to left. Do I read the words first, the pictures? I mean, so it, so you have to be predisposed to have a certain kind of, 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 of wiring in your brain, which a lot of people do. And of course, the immediacy of comics is wonderful, you know, that you can generally tell what the story is by looking at it. And yet also the, there's the ability of the, of the words to add tonality and depth and, and uh, subplots and, and um, emotions that make the, you know, when you're doing it, when it's being done right, it, they just, there's an interplay between the two of them. You know, that, again, is so simple that a child, you know, can understand it and yet has the potential. You know, one of my favorite, when I, when I teach, uh, I, I, I teach comic writing from time to time, and I did it a lot about 10 years ago, for about, for about 10 years. There's a story called the Harvey Picar name story. It's written by Harvey Picar, who's one of my idols uh, as a, independent alternative comedy writer I had the honor of being friends with Harvey or friendly with Harvey. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to aggrandize myself, but we were fond of each other. And I interviewed him one night in New York on stage. It was 
a great night. And it's called Harvey Peacock Name Story. It's four pages long or three pages. Each each page is 12 panels. And each panel just shows a shot of, of Crumb's version of Harvey dressed in a suit and tie, which Harvey rarely did. It's interesting. Shot from like maybe the, the chest up. And it, and it's almost like a monologue. It's almost, it, it's filmed almost as if you were filming a, a a, a comedian on television and yet you know and crumb manages to make the expression on harvey's face and body subtly different in each panel so it's really it's exciting in a way that you're not even conscious of and it, it seems to break every rule it's harvey picard telling a story about his name and about how he was the only harvey picard in the cleveland phone book then another harvey picard showed up and he needed to know who that person was. Then suddenly a third Harvey Picar showed up and who, you know, I mean, so it's a mon- it's a monologue done in comic book form. It's seemingly just putting the camera, you know, the camera eye in one spot. And then this guy telling this story, uh, which is the, what you would think would not work in a comic because you'd want a visual aspect, which Crumb gives you by showing... And then, you know, and, and I usually show this to people after I've told them, like, the basics of storytelling, like, you know, the kind of what makes a story. You have a protagonist, an antagonist, a complication, you know, you have a, you know, a second act turning for all that, all, all that stuff that we, you know, a lot of us uh, have either taught or heard or read about what makes a story. And this story, and yet the Harvey P. Carter's name story pretty much, you know, on the surface does not adhere to any of those rules. And yet there's a certain excitement to it, you know, and you really want to know what happens next, right? That's the key. Yeah, that's the thing you're trying to do in all storytelling. You want the reader or the viewer has to desperately know what happens next. And it, this, and, and somehow you get, you know, caught up in this story about the Cleveland phone book, right? At, which, I mean, I'm, I was, for anybody who's too young to know what a phone book is, uh, <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> you took the internet listing of everybody's phone number and printed it out and bound it in a in a book. That's the phone book. So <laughs> you know, so so that to me is comics can be anything. You know, again, as said, it's comics is words and pictures. You can do anything with words and pictures. You know, it. it I've always found that ex, that exciting. You know, what's exciting in a lot of comics is what you don't see. Because really, sometimes you walk past somebody reading a comic or you look down at even a comic you're reading yourself and you go, well, that's a bunch of like just sort of static images. You know, what's the big deal? What am I so excited about? Mm. There's something about that, the way that works and what happens in between the panels is the movie you make in your head. And it's just if you're tuned into it, then that medium, there's nothing like it, you know? Mm. Yeah, I want to say similar vein in that I want to talk more about comics, but um, what what have been like some of the the most frequent or most frustrating challenges that you have faced, both as a writer and an editor, if there's one that stands out more than the other, that is totally fair. Um, and how have you overcome them slash what advice would you give to people who are facing similar challenges well, or maybe you haven't overcome them that's also fair <laughs> yeah that's very very sneaky Katie. You, you managed to fit in about 20 questions in that one i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> well as someone who does that myself when i interview people i my hat's off to you for <laughs> it's always down to people right it's always down to the people you're working with mm. um and mis, you know, and miscommunication, which can sometimes be cleared up, and sometimes it can. Sometimes just the personality clash. Sometimes the personalities mesh so well that they can overcome any obstacle, and sometimes they don't mesh so so jarringly that there's no fixing it. But that's you know, that's it's ultimately when you're dealing with any art form, but especially something like a Marvel comic, which is where you're constantly juggling economic and creative needs right you you're dealing with people who are who are very creative and very passionate but by the same token they get paid by the page so um they want to do their best work they want to you know they want to take pride in their work but they also want to like feed their family and 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 not and not have to do redundant work that they see as unnecessary or or the editor just trying to impose 
their will for whatever reason. So that's, you know, it's always tough. That And there's just no predicting it. You know, people, I, I think maybe the hardest thing, though, just to sort of get a little less abstract and still say, so, you know, as an editor, you very often will inherit books you know, inherit, we call, we call them books in the business, you'll inherit books from another editor. And that editor will sort of give you the lowdown. Uh, you know, this person's easy to work with, that person's hard to work with. The worst thing is when a previous editor says, I laid down the law for those guys and, and I've got them trained. So when you say jump, they say how high. That never works. Those are always the the most incompatible impossible situations you know because that means that the previous editor had a relationship based purely on their personality and their and their individual relationship with those people and when you come in you know that's that's <laughs> very often a recipe for disaster because they're so used to working with that person who maybe reminds them of their mother or their sibling or their elementary school teacher that so that's that's the hardest part is finding people who you can work with as a team you know um you know that and when it works it's great when it's you know when it's good you know that that was you know luckily uh this uh, jm dematis guy and i always even when we, even when we didn't agree you know and i was always very grateful and and admiring of your of your dad for that because even when he and i didn't agree he never took a prima donna stand it was like let's talk about it and figure out a way to work a way to make it work which you would think actual adults would do all the time in business and 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 and, and creating stuff but uh, guess what it's it's actually relatively rare you know creatives can have an ego i understand that yeah yeah and and but you know but some there uh, you know that i guess that's why you see uh, you know editors using the same people over and over for different projects cuz okay here's somebody who i who who i mesh well with who will you know who will not take a comment i make as a threat to their entire existential being that will just take it as like a disagreement over you know over whether spider-man's webbing does x y or z you know <laughs> you know i mean and it's not, but it you know, it's often has to do more with the life philosophy or, or 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 philosophy towards work and creativity but you know it, it's i as a and like I said, somebody who gets along well with me may not get along well with somebody else and vice versa. You know, it really, a, a lot of it just comes down to that, to who you can work with. And, you know, and it, and it goes back to that, you know, just what role you play, you know, with, and it's funny, there was a, you know, na nowadays, and by nowadays, I mean the last 30 years, you know, before, before uh, email, before email was a big thing, you'd call an artist or a writer and most of them, since they weren't like, you know, in running businesses, they were doing creative work, would have only one phone line in the house. So, you know, their their wife or husband or kid would pick up the phone. And so, you know, you would develop this relationship with not just an artist, but with their with their family, you know, it would be, and it was very, you know, it was a whole other kind of dynamic than now with texts or emails where you you know, I've, I've had that happen, you know, this is like the bane of, uh, one of the banes of the internet age is that, you know, is that some people don't have any sense that there's another human on the other end of their, of the message, on the other end of the email, the other end of the text. And that's true. You know, I mean, I, I try to be careful with how I phrase things, and, but, you know, a lot of nuance that you'd have in a phone conversation. Uh, and certainly there's obviously, you don't have that kind of strangely enmeshed, or, you know, kind of relationship with a guy's or gal's family and, and, and children, you know, with spouse and children. It's, um, so, uh, it, it, so again, I don't even remember what the question was, but <laughs> did I come anywhere close to answering it? Yeah, I think I... I think we touched on a lot of challenges and a lot of like oh, challenges, right? Yeah. But yeah. also, I think the workflow commentary is really important too. Sort of how how challenging it can be to work back and forth with someone, and how having the right person is really important to that creative process. So, so yes, I think you did answer my question. <laughs> I also want to say I think it segues really well into the next question. Um, okay. I 
I do want to take a beat here because I know that there was talk of a cutoff and I want to make sure that we are we are staying on time. Do you need to go? No, I am happy to talk about myself endlessly. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right, then I will segue directly into the next question, which uh, I think you kind of touched on a couple pieces of it. Um, through through that answer, the the question itself is that there are you know of course many people who aspire to be writers and dream of specifically working on you know, names like like Spider Man or Iron Man or the Hulk you know like like really iconic things. Um, and so, uh, what advice would you give someone wanting to break into the comic book industry as a writer? You know, I think one is maybe like don't come in with the attitude of a prima donna. Uh, and two is is sort of like be open to the feedback and the people that you're going to work with. But I'm curious if there are additional things that are important for people to have in mind or that are maybe particularly important. You know, this is uh, this is a question that naturally we get a lot because because people want it. And so much of it is down to luck and chance. And, and the advice, you know, that I would give now is much different than the advice I would have given 25 years ago. 25 years ago, I would have said, you know, I mean, you have to have some experience writing. You, I mean, you know, I, hopefully, you know, one would start writing as a kid or a teenager if you really are, are, are intent on being a writer. But I would have said, if you want to write for Marvel or DC, come to New York. Uh, get a job as an intern or an assistant uh, and kind of work, you know, get to know people, network, learn the ins and outs of the business and, and work your way through, through the ranks, you know, and because a lot of people, including me did that. I didn't have to come to New York. I was from New York, you know, but that's why so many people in the early days of the business were from New York was because they were here already. Mm -hmm. I would say, Hey, don't put all your, don't bet all your marbles on, Marvel or DC, you know, they're, they are very niche-like, you know, as, as a, and just the editor, you know, I mean, now I'm sort of paraphrasing uh, J.M. Bananas again, the editor who loved you today or loved you last week may get fired or may go to another company or may get into another business or may get hit by a truck, you know, don't count on one company or one genre or one person, write a lot of different kinds of stuff, you know, write article, you know, self-publish when you can, put stuff up on the internet, try to write articles, try to write nonfiction, short form, long form, just don't, don't, try not to find yourself stuck, even if you, even if, you, or especially if you're successful in it, don't get stuck in, you know, where, where somebody gets fired tomorrow, that might be the end of your career. Try not to be, it's hard, it's hard to do because especially once you, if, if you should be on the inside track, then of course you get comfortable and, and you're doing what you want to do. I, I would say though, if, if comics is your love, find some way to self-publish on, you know, on, on ways on the internet that probably you, you and your listeners know better than I do. Uh, even if it's on your own website, which means probably, you know, if you're a writer, probably spending money to, to hire an artist to draw your stuff. Because even an artist who loves you and loves your vision and is committed to it, most cases, if they have, a, if they have to make a choice between paying work and passion work, they'll try to do the passion work, but most people need to make a living. So they'll do the the paying work, so maybe have a day job or something where you where you can where you can say to somebody, you know, I'd like you to draw my story, and here's how much I will pay you for your time and and your work, and you know, because um, to say to somebody, oh, I'll make you co-owner, or I'll, you know, and you'll make money on the back end. Well, that you can't you can't buy groceries or pay the rent with that. And let's face it, most creative endeavors do not, you know, make money. Uh, so to offer some, you know, look, that's why people still do work for hire from despite the lessons of history that work for hire is ultimately, in most cases, a sucker's game. And why would you do work for hire? Well, because you get to work on Spider-Man. You get to work on Wonder Woman. Uh, and Marvel and DC's checks clear, <laughs> you know, uh, at least at least for the time being. When they you to a story, they will, you know, they will pay you what they say. You know, so there's reasons people do work for hire despite all its drawbacks. Um, but even but those companies will, you know, I think they will tend to hire people who have demonstrated themselves in self-publishing or with a smaller publisher. You know, I think what I what you know the 
the cliche, and I've, this is probably the 10,000th cliche I've spouted tonight, but, um, you know, in any, in any job you have, but certainly in a, as a freelance writer or artist, you want to be the solution to somebody's problem. You don't yeah. want to be the problem. You want to be the person who comes in and makes, and, and makes the stressed out, overworked editor's job easier. Which also, which means something as simple as if you get an assignment and you're not going to be able to get it in on time, the human tendency is to hide and avoid that confrontation, to not call up and say, I'm sorry, I fucked up. It's going to need another few days. You have to make that call because for an editor, the worst thing is not knowing. If you call up your editor and say, I screwed up, I'm going to need another whatever, another week. Then they can make a decision. They can buy some time for you, or they can fi- hire somebody to help out. But once you know, once you become the biggest star in the business, then maybe you can throw your weight around. Uh, and even then, why would you want to do that? You know, um, you know, sort of. I've heard, you know, I have my own version of this saying, but I've heard a lot of different versions. But as a freelance creator, you need to be at least two of three things. You need to be brilliant, charming, and dependable. You got to be at least two of those. You know, an editor wants all three, but you can't be obnoxious, you know, crappy, and undependable. <laughs> you know, that, that would be the, the bizarre world trifecta. And um, you mentioned in, in that answer there talking between like publishing and editing and, and even, you know, cracking into the writing. Would you be able to kind of expand on the entire process of creating a comic book uh, from the initial idea to the finished product? And how, how does collaboration play a role in that whole cre- creative process itself? Uh, well, I mean, I think we covered a lot of it, but I'll, I, I mean, yeah. You know, let let's say you're I don't know Will Eisner, for instance, and I and I don't say that just because I'm a consultant to Will the Will Eisner Studios and run something called Will Eisner Week every spring around Will Eisner's birthday. But you know, let's say you know Will Eisner would be the archetypal, or Robert Crumb, or Art Spiegelman, Frank Miller. You know, these would be the archetypal one man bands. Even then, you know, you're still collaborating with editors, you're still collaborating with production people, with publishers, with distributors, with printers. So the process, but I mean, say, in a typical Marvel or DC comic, okay, it's Spider-Man, you know, uh, it's time for the new next issue of Amazing Spider-Man. Somebody has to generate the initial idea. That's often the writer, it can be the artist, it can be the editor, especially if it's like a big crossover storyline. Somebody has to come up with the basic, you know, Spider-Man has broken his wrist, um, and so he can't fight as well as he ordinarily would, and just that moment you know all his villains have teamed up to uh, kill him and meanwhile aunt may is in the hospital with a heart attack you know and and so all is happening at once and so peter parker has to you know that's that's like a one sentence thing that maybe somebody again the writer the editor the artist somebody uh thought this would make a great story or at least it would fill pages for a month somebody came up either either somebody was inspired or They had a deadline, and they don't want to print blank pages. So here it is. You take the building blocks of Spider-Man, put them together. But this is all, all these stories are the same story. It's just how they're handled. You know, it's just, you know, what's emphasized, uh, the skill set of the creators. You know, but you've got, you got a status quo, something disrupts the status quo, and then you're off to the races, you know. And and so uh, somebody comes up with a story, then somebody fleshes out the story. It may go into... A writer will then probably flesh it out to an outline, and then that's approved or not by the editor. And then that goes to a maybe a page. And everybody works differently, page by page breakdown. Eventually, you have either a plot, which is how a lot of comics were done at Marvel for years, maybe not so much anymore, which is like a little short story that the artist will then break down into panel pages and panels. You know, and all of it comes through to the editor. The editor, you know, gives approval or just changes or demands changes. The editor's kind of like the hub of a wheel, you know, with a spoke like a bicycle wheel with the spokes come in and out to the editor. And the artist will draw it and uh, and either the dialogue has been written at the same time as the script, like a movie script, in which case it'll be lettered. And then uh, an inker will go over, you know, somebody uh, will delineate the pencil art with uh, ink to make it uh, bolder and 
give a little more variety to the line and 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 then uh, so you know and, and then the, so then you have the 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 action you know the images and the words and the and then you know and then it goes through phase of being colored and uh, and there's probably a lot of magic that various departments and people do that I you know that I barely understood then and now in the in the digital era I understand less but you know something then goes out to the printer now it's, now it's usually a digital file and they print the comics but the you know there's a back and forth there is collaboration between a writer and artist with the editor so being the referee and the editor being the cult the quality control even if the writer and artist agree on what the story should be about and what should be on each page then the editor has to say well that this thing we all agreed on that we would do is not done clearly enough or efficiently enough or dramatically enough uh and so there's a series of, there's like an endless series of judgment calls all the while you have this ticking deadline in the background so it's it's balancing it's balancing that stuff so once again it is not brain surgery but it's not nothing either <laughs> so I'm going to do the thing that you love so much and ask you one question that is actually many. Um, <laughs> you have had uh, the incredible opportunity to work alongside Stanley. Um, I'm curious what it was like collaborating with him. Did he influence or shape the way that you approach writing at all? And also, what was it like being tasked with writing about him? You're right. That's, that's <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, I, I feel like I'm getting, um, you know, when they want to, when they want to see if older people are suffering from uh, dementia, they'll ask them like group questions like that to see if, uh, you know, what, are you still, are you still with us, Danny? <laughs> what, ob what objects did I name? Uh, who was the president? Uh, what street are we on? <laughs> Just tell me about Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Stanley's influence on me started as a child. I mean, that that really goes back to those Marvel comics because it was it was the content of the comics, the stories, the dialogue, the cover copy. But it, what Stan was able to do was to create a version of himself that felt like he was your friend, but didn't feel like this grown up was trying to be a kid's friend or trying to like pretend he understood like slang and vernacular that that kids and teenage it was somehow a hip adult who stayed an adult but somehow understood your love of these comics and these characters so that really is is where i go back with stan like millions of other people have done over the years i worked with him to a certain degree at marvel the most surreal probably being when i edited a, a script that he wrote he somebody else said it was a spider-man annual in 1984, plotted by Tom DeFalco, uh, drawn by Ron Friend, and uh, Bob Layton inked it, uh, and then Butch Geis also the two inkers. But Stan wrote the dialogue, and I had to edit them. I had to edit it, and there were some places where I thought it didn't work. And I told him, and he was very professional about it. To my astonishment, he didn't pull rank. When he thought I my suggestion or question improved it, he said so, and he thought, he wanted to stand his ground. He did. So I did not, I mean, I think one reason I was a good person to write his biography was because I was not in his inner circle. I was somebody who knew him, worked with him. Oddly enough, it was, I, I did more work with him after I left Marvel because anywhere I went, I was the guy who knew Stan. So because of that, I then uh, edited stuff on him, co-plotted some stuff with him. Actually, when things at Marvel were getting a little weird and I felt that I wanted and needed to leave, I, I took a trip to the West Coast to supervise the shooting of some holographic covers, don't ask. But, um, but then I kind of bonded with him and his wife uh, because that was the point where Marvel was trying to marginalize Stan as well. So I had this, and and then I uh, was his moderator at a lot when I worked for Wizard World, which is a chain of conventions. So I had these very, it wasn't a typical way that people, you know, at Marvel worked with Stan, you know, and yet I did intersect with him a lot and studied his career. So I think because I was not in his inner circle, I was a good person to write a reasonably objective biography. Obviously, there are people who loathe Stan who do not think I wrote an objective biography. Those are the, 
that would be the list of people I've blocked on social media because they do not come to you and say, excuse me, sir, I beg to differ on some of the details. It's like they're more like, Aah! so, you know, life is too short for that. So writing writing about Stan, but I did know him, and I and I did some of the last interviews with him, you know, although he said to me, I'm not doing any, in-. So it, you know, it was not authorized. My book was, nobody had approval over that book but me and my editor at, uh, at St. Martin's Press. Stan did not have any approval over it. Marvel did not have any approval over it. So Stan said, you know, to me, uh, when I told him that I had signed the deal to do the book, he said, well, I'm not, good luck, you know, I'm not going to tell people to talk to you or not to talk to you, and I don't want to be interviewed because I've been interviewed too much, and I'm, you know, I did two lengthy interviews with him ultimately. <laughs> no. What I, what I ended up doing, this was partly by plan and partly almost just inevitable given who I am and he was and the task that I took on, Stan started working in the comics business at age 17 in uh, 1940. And he was working in the comic business till he died in 2018 at age 95. His life story was in many ways the story of the comics business and of modern media in America and the world. And yet also, while I would never say I did the same job as Stan, he was a writer and editor of comics. Obviously, he took it to a whole other level than most people get to do. But because I'd sat in that chair and had to make a lot of the same kind of decisions, I had a certain understanding of what, of him and his life that even the best, most conscientious biographer or academic could not have because they hadn't done it. Plus, I was a Jewish kid from New York, uh, which he was too. That, that's part of my fascination, not only with the, the comic creators, but with Jack Ruby, you know, where... The comic, the founders of the comics industry were the same generation and from very similar background to my parents, aunts, and uncles. So to me, it was like, well, this is sort of an interesting alternate universe of people who had similar backgrounds, similar, um, you know, came from similar poverty and, and living in similar neighborhoods. How did they turn out this way? And my family, you know, went on their journeys. So... So I felt I brought a lot to Stan's particular story that I almost did a family memoir in disguise and and a psychological study in disguise of a certain generation and type of person. And so, you know, and then, of course, telling the story of the comic book business, which which I worked in for years and which and which was such a big influence on me in my childhood. So it was. It turned out to be a lot more personal book, you know. And as I said, I knew Stan, and uh, but not, but certainly, if Stanley was having a problem, you know, he, you know, I, if I was having a problem or Stan was having a problem, we weren't on each other's, you know, speed dials as people to call. Although I will say he was a great emailer. Stan was one of the champions of email because, you know, not unlike, you know, sort of a trade I have too. I'm not as diligent. He hated having anything hanging over his head. So for those of us who had his email and who he knew, he would respond in like an hour or less. Or you know, you know. So that was sort of an interest, and, and always was something very witty. And often he would actually answer the question I had for him. You know, uh, so so writing that book about Stan became personal for me in the way you know, and I and I think in his own way. I'm I have a feeling. Or I have a feeling. I know that it was personal or it is personal for your dad as well, Katie, because, you know, when something, as we were talking about, you know, eight or nine hours ago, you know, when something hits you that way as a child, and then it ends up being what you do for a living, you know, it's a mixed blessing, mostly good, you know, but it does definitely give you a connection to the material and the people that that maybe somebody else wouldn't have. Hmm. This is going to be a a, a, uh, a bit of a left turn here, um, although that is that was a a great answer to Katie's like seventeen very sly <laughs> questions there. <laughs> uh, Me but you, you, never. You, yeah, yeah, never, not even once. Um, but you kind of you there was a, a moment there where you touched on it briefly, and when you mentioned your uh, your block list on Twitter, um, and I would say that the comic books have a very passionate and sometimes <laughs> uh, vociferous. Uh, fan base i i'm curious how you either do or maybe do not interact with fans and to what extent fan feedback has 
you know, potentially influenced you and your work? You know, it's been many years since I had a day job at Marvel Comics. So, it, mm -hmm. you know, so this predates it. The Internet was just starting. You know, that, that the Internet was more relevant, I guess, in the, in the next job I had working for a guy named Byron Price. But we got a lot of fan mail, you know, and, and so it but it would be it would be rare that you know, the Internet is too easy. Right. If even if you're angry, if you're if you're angry and, and upset about a story or, or or something an artist wrote or said or, or a writer wrote or said. You have to sit down and write a letter and there's still a certain you know, period, there's a natural cooling off period between writing the letter, folding it up, putting it in the envelope, sealing the envelope, putting the stamp on, and then remembering to go to the mailbox, right? I mean, there's there's all these different moments where you might say to yourself, gee, maybe I don't want to threaten that guy's family, you know, uh, in a way that the police could come track me down or something mm -hmm. like that, you know? Uh, maybe I overreacted. Maybe it is just an actual comic book story and not, you know, uh, life or death. So we don't have that. Now you can write some crazy thing and have no no cooling off period and no reflecting period and just hit the send button and you know suddenly uh you know you're a nut on the internet. <laughs> you know? Um so we didn't have that. Like I said, we had plenty plenty of passionate letters. Uh, on just on a simple basic level, if your readers guess where the story's going, you have to change the story. If too many people have figured out the mystery or the or the supply, or or your surprise surprise plot twist that, that it turns out not to be such a surprise. Well, certainly you have like your focus group that'll tell you that'll let you know that you need to change it up. You know, there's there's this. Let's say the 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 passion that plays out very often ha revolves around. You know, and I guess because I wrote the book about Stan Lee, it re it often revolves around Stan Lee and Stan did or didn't do something horrible. My joke is that somebody one day is going to come out with a book. Where the title will be Stan Lee, worse than Hitler or only as bad as Hitler? You know, God. You know, I mean, because there are some people that's how they feel about Stan. Because because I think I think especially superhero comic fans or people who grew up reading superhero comic fans tend to look at things very black and white. You know, and and there's got to be good guys and there's got to be bad guys. Mm -hmm. And really, look, the idea, if you'd have said to these people creating these comics in like 1965, oh, you know, in the year 2023, people will be debating who did what, you know, last week, um, the comics you put out, they would go, no, really, you know, that's ridiculous. Who, who would, you know, who was going to think about this stuff past next month, much less, you know, 60 years from now. So certainly they never did anything I think comic fans tend to have that kind of black and white view. And I think people do because we grow up on this pop culture where everything is black and white and, you know, and easily solvable in 40, you know, in, in, in a half hour or an hour or 22 pages. Somebody asked me when I was touring, you know, I was in Los Angeles touring uh, to promote the Stan, the Stan biography. Somebody, you know, somebody said to me, why do you think there is such passion and, and, and this, you know, I mean, although, of course, 99% of the people in the world who even know who Stan Lee was think he's this lovable, all they see is the lovable old guy and the cameos in the movies and TV shows. Mm -hmm. But say that one half of 1% that might know about the behind the scenes conflicts, you know, the answer I came up with, and I'm, I'm not above quoting myself because I thought it was a reasonably intelligent answer to Charles Hatfield's questions. Hello, Charles, if you're listening. Everybody, and again, this may be revealing more about me than you want to know, but I mean, I think it's true for a lot of people. Many people have a story about how, how if it wasn't for this one guy that screwed your father, you know, back, you know, 50 years ago, your family would be rich and living on the Riviera and, uh, and, ski and st skiing in the Alps and, uh, and, and have a mansion in Malibu. You know what I mean? If it wasn't for that one son of a bitch who did uh, my father or my mother dirt, you know, they and I would have had a much happier, more prosperous, you know, and I think I think a lot of people have those narratives. And in that story, it's a lot easier to sympathize with, say, Jack Kirby, you know, who not only didn't hide his working class roots, but kind of proudly proclaimed them and did not have a day job, whereas Stan came from as much poverty as, as uh, Kirby did, 
and and in and in some in many ways is difficult a background, but you know chose to present a different face of the world and was you know he went to work for the company that was owned by a distant cousin you know that you know Martin Goodman was Stan's cousin by marriage, so even though he was not it wasn't like you know it, it wasn't as if he was Martin's son, he definitely you know had certain advantages although certain i think certain disadvantages that being the owner's relative. And have it's it's much easier to sympathize with Jack Kirby than it is with with Stan Lee. Stan never gave up his day job. Stan was wealthy. Although what people you know need to be reminded of is Stan Lee did not own any more of the Marvel characters than you or I do. So mm-hmm. yes, he was wealthy, but for someone who was involved, you know, and again, this is all the debate who did what, but certainly somebody who on paper and on legal documents was the person who co-created these characters. Both he and Kirby should have been a lot wealthier than, than than they were, but in part, Stan had that day job, right? So, but so you know, so when people came to to interview the Marvel phenomenon, one of my favorite, maybe it was Murray Kempton, but I could be wrong. It might have been his daughter. I think it was Sally Kempton. Don't quote, well, quote me, but I'm not sure if I'm quoting the right person. He talks of taking a visit to the Marvel offices in the in the first mar- phase of Marvel's heyday in the '60s, and not being able to figure out how this group of of what they saw as pretty colorless people were the ones who came up with these great adventures, you know, full of different levels of depth and meaning and emotion, you know, that somehow this they they were the very definition of the the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. So how do I deal with fans? Most fans who come up to you at a convention, the internet makes people very brave. Yes. So it's rare that someone will come up to you at a convention and say the same kind of insulting thing they will online. Although I have seen situations where people will sit in the audience at a panel and make all sorts of contorted, angry faces, and you want to say to them, we're having a Q&A, say whatever the fuck you want, but it's like, but they, you know, they'd rather sit there and be angry than, than ask a question for whatever reason. I went to a convention once uh, shortly after my book came out, and I've been getting a lot of shit online from maybe four or five people who, you know, refused to have a civil discussion but would only, you know, put, phrase things in an insulting, challenging manner. And I thought, oh boy, this is uh, now. Now I'm at a convention. I'm at a panel. I'm going to be a sitting duck for any of these. Uh, angry uh, people to take pot shots at me. And of course, I went, oh, duh, I'm at a convention. These people are here to have a good time, you know, and they do think of Stan as the cuddly, lovable guy and all the cameos. Right. That's mostly who's here. You know, they they want to get their books signed. They want to, you know, they want to hear stories about the people behind the scenes. Their agenda, you know, for the most part, is not the agenda of the people uh, online who who spend every waking minute really, I think, getting revenge for how badly their parents were treated by whoever, you know. And 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 I don't want to, you know. I mean, that sounds dismissive, you know, uh, in a certain way that I don't mean it to, but. But I do think that there's something about the accessibility of comic book creators that we do show up at, right? If you want to meet Steven Spielberg, it's highly unlikely, no matter who you are, that you're going to meet Steven Spielberg. It's just, you know, unless you are a billionaire or unless you are, you know, a fellow movie director, you're just not going to meet Steven Spielberg. If you wanted to meet Stan Lee, it would not have been that hard to meet Stan. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So comic, there's something about com- even the most famous and successful comic creators, you can meet them, you can talk to them. Uh, and I think that's very nice, you know, it's a nice thing about comics, but, but there, that is a big difference. So I think there's that relatability hmm. that people, because God only knows, people that they, you know, say movie directors or producers they love have got closets filled with skeletons. <laughs> You know, much worse than anything Stan ever did. <laughs> and yet, because Stan and comic people have that familiarity, it's easier to get pissed off at them. <sighs> okay, what, what are the next 30 questions? <laughs> so the next 30 questions that I'm going to just ask you right now, um, we are going to talk about your newest work uh, here in like one or two questions. Uh, but 
in the meantime, we've talked about your comic book career. We started talking about your book with Stan Lee. What about these other books that have kind of been the in-between time? You know what I mean? Uh, the, so including like Superman on the couch and A Marvelous Life. I forget Disguised as Clark Kent. But... And Disguised as Clark Kent. What um, what inspired you to explore the like the cultural and psychological aspects of superheroes? I've always been a writer. Ever since I was a kid, I've been writing. I was one of those people who I'd go to the bookstore and I'd want to see whose books mine would be in between. By the way, it was Faulkner and Fitzgerald, in case you were wondering. Two very good names. <laughs> so that's always been what I've done. And obviously I did that at Marvel. I had various things got complicated uh, in a corporate manner at Marvel at a certain point, which is when I left to go into the internet and do online comics and then I some animation. So I think this goes back to what I was talking about bef you know, before about there are some people who have a single goal in mind. They have to have that goal and other people sort of have a range. I think most people have a range of stuff that they would like to do, you know, that, that combines with the Venn diagram, what they can do. So I had, uh, gone through um, several different career uh, highs and lows, you know, with my basic identity always being a writer. Even when I made films, I, I looked at it in a writerly way. So this will be this is this will be a very dull and yet I think maybe instructive story. Went to a high school reunion. A friend of mine, a classmate of mine, was an editor at a academic publishing house, and he said, "You got any ideas for books?" <laughs> That was, which is, and I uh, said, I, I can make it my business to have some ideas for books. And I <laughs> came up with like 20 different ideas. And they were all things I wanted to write about. It wasn't like I was, you know, it was, it was, it was at the very beginning, uh, really of this, of the, of the superhero, there'd been a few superhero movies, but it certainly wasn't a distinct genre and movement. So Superman on the couch was one of the ideas. And it, it made sense to me to do a psychological study. I was always interested in psychology. You know, it was, okay, what is it about the characters? And what is it about the readers? Fa you know, can fans with capital F fans and, and small F fans. What is it that makes comic books and superheroes appealing to these people and what made it appealing to me why did i you know when i first worked at marvel i thought gee it might be interesting to work at marvel comics for a few months turned into my entire well working at marvel in particular turned into uh, close to 20 years so what is it about me about the characters who would gravitate towards marvel characters as opposed to towards dc characters um, who would find no interest in superheroes at all? You know, what, you know, so that, all those questions were in my mind. And so that started me on that journey to that. And then, um, so that was that, that was that book. And it's really as much a sociology book as, as it is a, uh, a psychology book. And also another thing, as I, as I think back then, weirdly, no, there had been no psychological studies of, of superheroes or comic books since Frederick Wortham's book. Since Seduction of the Innocents in 1954, which was really weird. I kept waiting for somebody to tell me, oh, no, you forgot about this book or that book. But there was no book that took that angle. So I just thought, OK, well, let me, you know, let me give it a shot, which is weird because then I ended up being friendly with and, and working with a lot of people with actual psychology degrees who or therapists and also psychology professors, you know, for uh, there's something, uh, you know, so Travis Langley, Larry Rubin, uh, Robin Rosenberg. Sure, I'm leaving out a bunch of people, but they, you know, Larry Rubin and I, uh, we're still uh, have this thing called the Superhero Squad, which I guess we can't use that name anymore because it was a cartoon show called that. But about how to, you know, teaching corporate um, groups how to you find their inner superhero and stuff. We ended up having a very surreal adventure doing that, but we're still available if anybody wants us to come talk to their corporate or school or whoever about finding you're in a superhero you know so i that so all these things branch into one into another so i did that book 
and then uh, for the same editor, for Evander Lamke, who at that time was at the Continuum. Okay, what's my next book? Well, again, it's sort of similar to the Jack Ruby thing. I have a deep and wide Jewish background, both ethnically, culturally, and, and uh, religiously, although I'm not particularly religious these days. All right, so let me do a deeper dive from Superman on the Couch into, into Disguise as Clark Kent subtitled Jews, Comics, and the Creation of the Superhero. And so I interviewed, thanks to the miracle of modern medical science, I was able to interview a lot of these older guys who, who you know, who had, who had survived a lot of intense medical conditions because they had, you know, science had evolved to the point where I could interview Erwin Hazen and Jerry Robinson and Stan Lee and Joe Kubert and, and a lot of other people. I had those interviews and my own insights and a lot of research. And so that became that book. So it's, so that's sort of how that journey happened. And then I wrote a bunch of I wrote a bunch of books that you've never heard of that I did strictly for the paycheck. You know, I've written a very little known biography of um, YA biographies of movie stars whose names I can't even remember. And, you know, those were, you know, maybe not my proudest work, but I did as well. I did, I did them as good as I could and I got paid. You know? <laughs> so in between, there was all that other kind of stuff. Um, I wrote the Rough Guide to Graphic Novels for when the Rough Guide Travel Company doing culture books and that. Which was odd to me. They did not. They did not select me to do the Rough Guide to Superheroes, but that was fine because that gave me a chance. That so doing the Rough Guide to Graphic Novels gave me a chance to expand my own knowledge base and reading. And then you know somewhere after that, the Stan Lee book I've been trying to do for years couldn't convince Stan to do it as an authorized book. He said to me, "Danny, if I wanted anybody to do it, it would be you, but I don't want to do it." Now was I the tenth person he said that to that week? I don't know. But that you know so and eventually I did sell it as as a non authorized book, which I think was to the benefit of the book and my own career because it it meant I didn't have to just parrot any company line or Stanley official story. It meant I could do a warts and all biography, although it's quite clear from the book that I admired and liked Stan, but there's a lot of stuff in my book. You know, it's funny, people who think it was some kind of hagiography clearly have not actually read the book because there's a lot of stuff. I just don't put neon arrows to it you know, to, and, and, and organ music in the background to emphasize it. So that's that journey. And, and uh, like I said, I've been, I kind of hoped and, and was driven to do creative type stuff my whole life. Uh, and I enjoy getting lost in the, you know, being in the zone when it's good of like you're doing, you're writing something and, and it's not, I don't know if it's ever easy, but sometimes it just flows or you look back on it and you go, how the hell did I write that? How did that come out of my brain? Because I, I couldn't do that again. <laughs> and yet, there it is, black and white, printed in front of you. So, again, I have no idea if I've answered the question, but that's sort of my journey of, you know, the world is very lucky I didn't become a doctor or a lawyer because I would have been a terrible doctor or lawyer, <laughs> you know, and, and, and very unhappy doing that. Kind of taking a slightly different turn, we've talked a bit about how the comic book industry has evolved since, you know, you got started in it. Um, what do you think is going to be the future of comics and how do you see the industry evolving in the coming years? Huh. Um, people love comics. They've always loved, you know, pictures, you know, storytelling with pictures and words. They always will. I think if, if the if the scholastic and other independent graphic novels are an indication, it's sort of, it's a two-part question. Is comics a viable way for a large number of people to make a living? I don't know. Maybe not. Is comics an exciting medium that, that millions and millions of people love and, 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 and get something out of and feel attached to? Yes. So the medium is healthy. The diversity of subject matter and, and creators is endless and 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 just wonderful how many people outside of a select few will be able to uh and of course we're not even talking about the internet i mean god knows there's there's so much comic content on the internet that just the bit that i know of is overwhelming and there's so much i'm not aware of so the medium is healthy the audience is healthy whether there'll be more than a select few who will actually make a living at it or even a great living at it that's a question mark but you know as a medium and as a source of entertainment and education and, and inspiration uh, it's not going anywhere well, i'd love to hear that uh shifting directly from future uh from looking to the future to right back to the past <laughs> <laughs> we're doing a lot of time jumping <laughs> <laughs> we made so many turns i think we're certainly we must have gone in a circle by now 
Yeah, probably at some at least a circle, if not more. <laughs> not more. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious if there is one thing that if you could jump from you know speaking of time jumps, if you could jump from where you are now back to your yourself as you first began the process of you know like yeah. getting into the comic book industry, is there one piece of advice that you would offer yourself with the experience that you have now? I think it would be what I said before. Don't become so in love with one particular genre or one particular company that it becomes, that it defines you. And, 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 and if things go south with a person or company or genre, that you're suddenly left adrift. You know, I think mm-hmm. that happened that happened to me to a certain extent, and it happens to a lot of people, especially if you're doing well. If you're riding high and you're, you know, and you're making uh, a lot of money and, and, and you're getting a lot of praise from your peers and your bosses and your fans it's easy to forget that 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 could change overnight so yeah you know do a lot of different kind of writing you know i mean it should as much as possible it should be writing you enjoy and you're inspired by and try to try to minimize what you do just for the paycheck and even the stuff you do just for the paycheck try to find something you can enjoy with it but yeah don't become dependent on one person company uh or, or genre really you know or even one medium you know if you love comics do comics but do movies do novels do work you know just do you know do stuff that ex- that explains to people how to put together their furniture do whatever it takes to you know to keep you going through different phases cool well put i mentioned it earlier in this uh, in this recording tonight, but you recently released a new book, uh, Jack Ruby, The Many Faces of Oswald's Assassin. I am one of those people who has, like, <laughs> from a young age, just had great interest in the entire era, the the politics of the time. Uh, my mom had always been, like, she was a little girl when he was assassinated 60 years ago and has told me since I was young especially living through 9-11, that she remembers watching the news of it being reported on TV as a small child. So it's always kind of had this intrinsic aura about itself, the whole story, uh, the historical event, what really happened, the mystery or conspiracy surrounding loose ends involving the story itself. And now I get to talk to you after you wrote this book about Jack Ruby, like such an infamous, infamous character in modern American history. What was it like researching the book and what did it mean to you, uh, especially given like the 60th anniversary and and everything else involved in your writing process? You know, I, I, I think like with the Stanley book, I was kind of naive. I, I knew there were all these different theories and all these different books. I hadn't quite realized the extent of it and, and the extent that Jack Ruby was part of it. I mean, at one point, I thought I was going to do a much broader book about Oswald and Kennedy, and I'm so glad I, I just narrowed it down to Ruby. And, and, and again, I, I realized fairly early, all right, I am not solving this case. Smarter people than me have tried. And there's a lot of theories that are not crazy. It's a lot of, you know... Most of them do have this phrase in them, which is, or a phrase something like, it only stands to reason. One can only assume. It's only logical. In other words, they don't really know, but they're mm-hmm. just educated guests. And again, not crazy people. And, and so I decided, all right, let me do a story, again, about this guy. What I say to people is, imagine your craziest cousin. That is, if you yourself are not your own craziest cousin, but assuming your craziest relative walked up on live TV and shot Lee Harvey, Harvey Oswald, how would you react? What would that do to your life? How would that affect you and and everybody else related? So in a certain way, that's the angle I took. And so I interviewed his niece and nephew. You know, imagine your name is Ruby. You live in Dallas. You're 12 years old. You've been bragging to everybody that your uncle owns a strip club because you're 12 years old and your uncle owns a strip club. <laughs> right? And yeah. then your uncle changes history by killing Oswald on TV. And then two days later, you have to go back to school. What does that do to your life? You know, I mean, similarly, you know, I mean, I, 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 you know, I didn't touch on it, but she was somebody I used for uh, background information was Abraham Zapruder's granddaughter. You know, she wrote a whole book about how that, how, how that, you know, uh, that 
footage that uh, the Zafruder film affected that whole family's life going forward. So I interviewed the uh, children of the other strip club owners who were Ruby's rivals. And then the thing that I had, I inter- the person I interviewed, who was very generous both with his time, his insights, and everybody in the Ruby courtroom was writing a book. You know, that was just, it was a... It was the biggest circus trial until the Chicago 8 or Chicago 7 trial. Okay. So one of the people very involved was Ruby's rabbi, a guy named Hillel Silverman. You may know him better as the father of the actor Jonathan Silverman of Weekend at Bernie's. Okay. That was Jack Ruby's rabbi. And he visited Ruby three or four times a week for like four months in prison and made elaborate notes. And he was intent, intending to write a book. Um, and I interviewed him about 10 years. He, did, he actually just died at age 99, six months ago. But I interviewed him about 10 years ago. And I, and I had other, access to other interviews with him. And he said to me, would you like to see my notes? And when I visited Jack in prison every other day for four months. And I said, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just, you know. So, you know, so, I mean, that that was a resource that I had. I don't think I'm the only person who saw them, but I think I made more use of them than anybody. And so a lot of it is sort of intercutting his observations uh, and reflections. You know, so that was how I approached research and the book. Because, you know, the thing, uh, you know, about the Ruby, but the, the Kennedy assassination is not suffering from a lack of information. What it's suffering from is is way too much information for any one person to process, and you know, and a lot of plausible scenarios. And so, and so, I tried to focus on on Ruby. I tried to give voice to some of the more plausible theories about why he did what he did. But ultimately, it's kind of a psychological study and a family study. How. You know, how did this guy get to be at this point in time? And then how, going forward, did the family dynamics... You know, the thing, both he and Oswald were nuts. They had very personally very erratic you know, psychological histories and came from very disturbed families. The question is, were they lone nuts or not? That's the question that I'm not smart <laughs> enough to figure out, you know? But but let me... So that's what I did in the book. and And people do seem, you know, probably... A lot of, I've had a lot of good response. Probably the person you might have uh, heard of who gave me the uh, a response was um, a, a blurb on, on on Twitter, actually, you know, which is, you know, we all have not such great feelings about Twitter for good reason now. But um, Peter Baker, who's the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times, you know, wrote a couple of very complimentary sentences about it online, which I was pretty thrilled about, you know. So people who know their stuff seem to feel I've done a pretty good job of exploring what I set out to do. I'm sure, I, no doubt, I will have people who, like, I don't want to trivialize the Kennedy assassination by comparing it to who created, you know, the Hulk, but it does have certain things. There are certain bits of history that people get very justly um, worked up about, and so I'm sure that you know, I will hear from people who think that I didn't do right by, by the data, but I tried to do the best I could. So that I approached it not thinking that I was going to solve it, you know, that after 60 years, I didn't think, you know, and a million people trying to, I didn't think I was going to be the guy to crack the case and, you know, find something nobody else did. <laughs> Except in, I, a, except in a psychological way that I think maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're absolutely right with that. There's too much information out there and too many logical reasonings that could justify right. any number of scenarios that are real or not real, <laughs> depending right. on who you talk to. So that's that's really interesting. I definitely, after, I'm, I'm doing a Brandon Sanderson book right now, but as soon as I get done with that one, you're like next in my audible queue, so... <laughs> Oh, well, you know, I, I, uh, but I guess I should mention this. I've done the audiobooks of all my books. Uh, oh, excellent. So if, if you've enjoyed hearing this um, mellifluous voice for the past two hours, imagine <laughs> 14 hours being pumped into your head. <laughs> if you like two hours, try 14. That's right, exactly. <laughs> excellent. But yeah, I've read, I even went back. I, so I did, the Stan, I did the Stan Lee book and then the Ruby book. By the way, and then I went back and did the other two books, which are actually out of print, Superman on the Couch and the Sky is Law Camp, but they are in print and available as audio discs. But, I'll, but there's, for any of you authors out there, there's nothing like reading your book out loud to find all the mistakes you didn't catch. Oh, God. And, you and, and, the ten, and the ten other people who 
read your book before it went to the pub, went to the press, went to print, didn't catch the, the stuff that you just go. If you know the human tendency is if something is spelled right to just sort of figure it must be right, but boy oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> This, yeah. uh, well, actually, the audio book is the more correct version. I corrected a lot of like just stupid stuff that <laughs> that that, uh, that the audio book corrected. That's awesome. I love it when authors read their audio books because it, it feels more like a conversation with you know the creation that they've been putting so much time and energy into. And it, I think there's like something that kind of comes off the page, if you will. Uh, that you can kind of convey with some of the nuance and the tonal uh, responses to the way you're reading your own material and everything else. So I always really enjoy that. Okay, well, you're right. And the, and the unsung heroes of audiobooks really are the uh, directors and editors. Yeah. They can take all your ums and ahs and mispronunciation and <laughs> oh, yeah. edit it out and, and make it flow seamlessly as if you were some kind of brilliant you know, audio artist. You know, they, so, so those... Those are really the unsung heroes of audiobook. Well, Danny, thank yeah. you so much for spending yeah. your entire evening with us. Oh, well, thank you for being interested. And uh, yeah, let me know when it when it uh, appears so I can uh, promote the hell out of it. And, and thanks for asking. Yeah, of course. Thank you for joining us. This has been lovely. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. All right. So you guys take care. Until next time, I'm Katie. <laughs> I'm Ben. And I'm Zeki. <laughs> and this has been How the Fuck. Hey, nerf herders. You sure you want to go with that? Hey, everyone? There we go. More inviting. Have you ever had a movie that you really wanted to love, but something holds you back? Or one that you did love in spite of a flaw? Well, I'm Casey. And I'm Sam Alisea. And on another pass, we sit down with cool guests to look at movies that we find fascinating. But flawed. And we try to imagine what could have been done when they were made to give them that little push. We're not experts. We just believe in criticism. Uh, constructive criticism. Sure. So come take another pass at some movies with us. And every now and then, we can celebrate movies that did it on their own, too. You can find us at CertainPOV.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Pass it on. Hey there, Screen Beans. Have you heard about Screen Snark? Rachel, this is an ad break. They aren't screen beans until they listen to the show. Fine. Potential screen beans. You like movies and TV shows, right? I mean, who doesn't? Screen Snark is a casual conversation about the movies and television shows that are shaping us as we live our everyday lives. That's right, Matt. We have a chat with at least one incredible guest every episode, hailing from all walks. We've interviewed chefs, writers, costumers, musicians, yoga teachers, comedians, burlesque dancers, folks in the film and TV industry, and more. We'd be delighted for you to join us every other Monday on the Certain POV Podcast Network. Or wherever you get your podcasts, fresh and tasty off the presses. What?
but that's no that's not can i call them screen beans now fine screen beans so tune in and we'll see you at the movies or on a couch somewhere because you're a whole screen beans now